event in the, for the program on ethics, society, and the environment here at Harvard State University. <laughs> I'm very pleased uh, to introduce to you Jeremy Bendekemer, who is the um, Bendik Schneider Professor of Ethics. Beamer Schneider. Schneider, right? Like Bendik. <laughs> Beamer, Beamer Schneider Professor of Ethics at Case, at Associate Professor at Case Western University. He's been my friend and colleague in the profession for about 12 years now. Yep. Um, and we worked together some time ago. He's been doing work in environmental ethics for a good number of years, at least since and before 2008 when we worked together and uh, had this volume with MIT, which I'll, I'll mention a bit more in a, in a moment. He's got his own book called uh, The Ecological Life. What's the subtitle? Well, Discovering Citizenship and a Sense of Humanity. In a Sense of Humanity. And so um, Jeremy brought to my attention the real importance of refocusing on the deep ecological sense of our own true humanity, uh, which was a novel way to think about environmental ethics for me at the time, given so much dogmatic rejection of anthropocentrism. And we share an interest in virtue theory and work together then to organize a conference on uh, adapting or ethical adaptation to climate change, thinking about largely how uh, our moment in time, you're moving into the Anthropocene and uh, such radical background anthropogenic drivers of environmental change really will require us to revisit our conceptions of what it is to be a human and what it is to be a good human and what environmental goodness is and what our responsibilities are to the natural world. So in some ways I hope that's a bit of a segue into his talk today, which is on anthroponomy. <laughs> I, I struggle on it every time. And rock. And rock. Well, I'll let him explain that so he helps me in welcome uh, Jeremy. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, really nice to, uh, nice to be here. Alan is a, uh, really a wonderful person, a friend, and a um, really good person to work with in the field. So I actually wanted to just come out and meet his colleagues and talk to him, and then he like wrote me into this. And I'm perfectly happy to, um, to share <laughs> some of what I've been working on, but I really, I really, I like dialogical situations, so I actually feel a little awkward being here at this point. Um, and I really want to learn from what you think about this. Um, the other thing, just to prequel, is this is part of a whole set of different papers at different levels of technicality and on different aspects of this uh, concept of anthroponomy. Um, I asked Alan in, in advance, in line with my philosophy of education, what what are what are folks what are what are you folks working on? What's going on in your classes? And I actually asked him about classes more than say the research of the uh, of the program you're in, the school you're in. Um, I can find that research online, but I also um, in my I guess you could say in my career, I always find that the classroom is the place where um, complicated issues first get broached in many cases, and in any case, they kind of they have to get resolved in a way that can be spoken of in plain speech. So um, besides the fact that we are in a university and the whole purpose of this ultimately is our responsibility to our students. So I asked him about this and he said, well, we're working a lot on environmental imagination in the class I'm working with, in particular political imagination. And um, so I decided to retort even what you've seen in the, the, the blurb um, that's on the poster in terms of this question of political or kind of what kind of environmental or political imagination is fitting for, um, let's say, life uh, more um, popularly in the Anthropocene, or maybe a little more technically in a in an era of planetary scale of environmental change, and so that's the background of this. Um, the last caveat I'm just going to make is that um, I mean and, uh, Andrew said that we we both kind of come out of an appreciation of ancient philosophy. Um, he referenced virtue ethics. And the other thing um, I've really been working on, the, the, the book I'm about to have come out, is a, it's not a standard philosophy book. It's a, it's a mixed genre book that's a set of what are called, in, ancient, in the ancient tradition, they're called escases, which is the uh, often translated after Ignatius of Loyola as spiritual exercises, but really kind of revamped by Foucault when he rediscovered the historian of ancient philosophy, Pierre Hadot, and the way that Hadot was bringing back the idea of philosophy as a way of life, which was really the way philosophy was understood, at least I agree with Hadot, for most of the tradition until the rise of the research university. 
And so I've really been working on that, and, and my commitment to it comes from various dialogical concept, contexts and social practices that I engage in in Cleveland, from um, a meetup group that you'll see very shortly that's working on some of the issues here, to um, various kinds of programs I do through the chair that I have at the university, which are grouped under the metaphor of something called the ethics table. And I guess I could say just one last thing is some of these, well, we'll see, I mean, some of these kind, of, some of the things we're gonna talk about use big words and they are, they can become very complicated and they can also be very contentious and need a lot of analytic clarification. At the same time, I think I'm interested in putting big concepts out there and thinking about how people, everyday people, how we as everyday people can start to relate to them. And so that comes from my interest of, of, of kind of starting with philosophy the way I started at it when I wasn't thinking I was going to be a professor. And the way that I think a lot of the people in Cleveland and in my community relate to it, which is that, you know, it's a potential source of illumination and political agency, and um, it's the kind of thing that you can make into part of a way of life. So I just wanted to put that out as kind of some framing comments. Okay, so some of you may have heard the music I was playing coming in. Which I don't have, it's, 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 I don't have particularly much of a story to talk about it. I'll come back to it later. But it was something that was sent to me recently just by a friend. And I felt that the mood of the music captures something I'm going to get to shortly, which is a, is, is a mood of the kind of imaginary that I would like to put forward. So those of you who heard it, just keep that in your mind, and I'll come back to it later and talk a little bit about why I actually think the mood is important. Um, okay, so let's let's start. Um, so if we're starting from an everyday context, at least the kind, I, I don't want to assume what your life is like. I know the life of my students um, at Case Western, which is a very STEM-heavy, very free professional school of kind of very earnest, triple majoring, double minoring, hardworking students, <laughs> a little overdetermined with time. And if I think about the, the various kinds of people who come to what's called the Moral Inquiries, which is a meetup group in this one neighborhood of Cleveland that has a bit of a history like Kate Ashbury does in San Francisco. Um, and these are people who are retirees. They're people who come to talk about moral philosophy after work. Um, they're some of them had a little bit of philosophy. Some of them didn't have any. Um, and it's really a, kind of an amazing group. We may talk about it later. I'm going to use it as an example. When I put myself in the position of my non-philosophy major students, the people who come into this, um, this, this conversation group, um, I, the, the idea that I'm going to get to later in the talk of anthroponomy is completely remote from consciousness. Right? So in terms of technical philosophy, if we're looking at like a phenomenology of moral life, the way that moral life appears, um, the, 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 top, the, top, the point I want to get to later in this talk is something that is just not on the horizon. Um, and it, it, it rather, what structures people's lives is what I'm going to call, so first piece of technical jargon, but at least try to put it in a way that is pretty intuitive, what I call presentist modality. Um, in other words, a way of life, a mode, a way of living that is presentist. Okay, so what is presentism? Um, there's a lot to say about it and a lot to ask about it, but presentism is roughly, um, let's see if I can get it here. Yeah, what is presentism? Um, it's, I'll go to de facto and de jure in a minute, but it's, it's bias against future generations. Okay, so you think of racism and sexism, right? So presentism is a form of temporal bias. So um, there's a lot of questions here in intergenerational justice, intergenerational ethics, but the basic idea is that insofar as we're structured in a way of life that is presentist, we, um, and I, I'm very minimal about this because there are all sorts of issues that people who work in intergenerational equity get, you know, really go to town on. They're very complicated issues. But I'm, I'm interested in what Bernard Williams used to call one thought too many when he talked about um, whether or not you should be a consequentialist or, or a decent person when dealing with some of the complicated ethical problems that come up in our ethics classes, like you've got two people who are drowning, which one do you save? And there's all these kinds of uh, calculi that people use when you get into consequentialism. I like to flip it around and think that the problem with presentism is that we have one thought too few. 
Okay, and so that presentist modality is a way of life in which the thought that people um, in the far future, and when we're talking about planetary security, environmental change, of course, we're talking really about far future generations. We're talking about time scales that blow up beyond, um, beyond human imagination in most cultures. Um, so thousands of years, right? So that is just not, a, that there's not a place in everyday life for people to keep minding, um, minding the idea that our actions are affecting those people and that we may be taking too much of what is due to them or not considering the ways that our mode, a collective mode of life may be affecting them. So is that really clear? It's pretty simple, but I just wanna make it the, the basic idea. The details are complicated. So how does president modality work? So the idea, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a little bit, you'll see later on I use more Anglo, Anglophone moral philosophy, but I'm actually gonna use a little bit of continental philosophy. I like, I like the Foucauldian school a fair amount as it was interpreted by this guy, uh, Ranciere. Um, and I like him actually for his philosophy of education, which pretty much amazed me. But then I, I realized that he had a lot to lot to say on this one point. So Ranciere's teacher was a guy named Louis Althusser, who's famous for an article, I mean, he's, he's famous for many things, his, his reading of Capital, his reading of Lenin, or his reading of, sorry, Capital after Lenin. Um, but he's also, he's like probably most cited in cultural studies for this article um, ideolo on ideological state apparatuses, if you've ever heard of it. So the idea that Althusser has is that we go to say the, we go through say the French school system, in this country, we go through the US school system. And in the process of going through the school system, we're literally um, behaviorally and ideologically trained to follow certain cues in the environment which are automatic. The one that I think is very real now is, is grading for students. I mean, grades have always are kind of a perennial issue of, of adolescent and also real critical kind of engagement since they're quite problematic. But after No Child Left Behind, it's the level of anxiety and the automatic kinds of responses that I see in my students at Case around grades are so, um, so deep and pervasive that I feel that I've seen in just the course of my limited life a real drawdown in the ability of people to take academic and intellectual risks, a real um, a much more increased tendency to gain the system and so on. So the idea that, that Alfred had, he called this interpolation, and he, he used an example that I'm gonna argue is not actually, it's a misleading example, but his idea was something like this. Like, so I'm walking down the street and I say, um, I say, hey, Alan. And Alan just looked at me. Um, and, and, and somebody, or somebody shouts at me, hey, Jeremy. And before I can do anything, I turn and look at them. Or if I recognize their voice and I don't like them, I still tense up, and hopefully I'm a decent guy, but just imagine I'm a jerk or something. I tense up, right? And so the idea is that there's an, like he used the example of a name to describe interpolation. You're called, and before you can do anything, you have an automatic response. Similarly, if you've gone through No Child Left Behind, you've seen the economy crash, right? Somebody kind of waves the threat of grades in front of your face, and before you know it, you seize up. You can actually feel it in your body, there's things you gotta do, da 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 So that's the idea of interpolation. Um, and I, this is just an aside, uh, if you read Ranciere's notes from the year after he had, right the year before he started having a falling out with Althusser, you actually realize that Althusser probably got this idea from Ranciere, but that's just a side comment. Um, and the Foucauldian school calls this interpolation subjection. Um, it's you're being made into a particular kind of subject. Namely, in this case, I'm gonna talk about presentist interpolation, presentist, presentist subjection. In other words, we're being made into an automatic response according to which we will foreclose thinking about future generations. We won't, we'll have one thought too little because of the way we're interpolated. That's the, that's the thought behind presentist modality. So there's a lot of big words that I'm not really happy about, but clear enough? For starters, we'll have to ask what is like where does presentist interpolation happen? What does it look like? But that would be the thought. Um, if you just want one other really good example of interpolation, um, there's this 
and Alan reminded me of this, like many, many years ago, I came to talk with you in your class at Fort Lewis College in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently I used the same movie <laughs> like, like 12 years ago and I didn't even remember it. Um, it's one of my favorite movies, but um, it's a movie about what it was like for this kid, who may or may not be Tarkovsky, the filmmaker himself, to have grown up um, inside and outside of Moscow during the Stalinist era and during the Second World War. And there's this amazing scene where the mother, um, he remembers, this kid remembers, he's trying to figure out where he got some of his anxiety from. It's a very kind of psychoanalytic movie, although it doesn't use those concepts. And he's remembering, he has a very kind of conflicted relationship with her, and he's remembering this time when she just tore out of the house in a panic that she was a copy editor in a printing house in Moscow, and she tore out of the house in a panic because she woke up from a kind of dream and thought that she had missed an, a word that somehow, we never find out what the word is, that somehow was an obscene word, and it was gonna go into print, right? So I think the thought would be that if she had been caught with that, she might have been sent off to the camps. And there's this amazing, it's an amazing scene, because it kind of comes out of our dream it feels like a dream, where all of a sudden you see her in black and white, and the movie switches between black and white and color, and newsreel footage, and kind of reconstructed home movie style things. And you see her kind of just tearing down this path in a, in a storm until she charges into the printing shop and like kind of just like, like a, and just like, just tears her way through the thing until she can get to the galleys, and then kind of realizes that it was all in her head. But that's, that's interpolation, you know, turned up to 11 to do our Spinal Tap reference, right? Like, it's like that she's terrified that she's going to get something wrong in the Stalinist system. So she absolutely upends her life in order to conform to the authority structure of the social, social political system she's in. So the question for President Modality that we, we ask a lot in the groups in Cleveland is, to what extent is our social life here structured in such a way that for all extents and purposes, it is, it, it, is, it is highly unlikely that we will give room and space and time and thought and political action <clears throat> to fairness toward future generations. That's the thought. What are the structures that interpolate us that way? And if you want like just one very simple indication of this, this is, I mean, just think about not what is happening, but what is not happening with reference to the, with the current presidential um, election, right? So there are, I mean, there are candidates who are putting future generations on, kind of in mind, but there isn't, there isn't anything like a clear sense of outrage that this isn't a central issue that ought to be considered. And the fact that we don't actually have, I mean, we I, is again, is, we as a representation of the fact of the silence, not of what we're actually thinking in this room, the fact that there isn't a kind of immediate indignation over this fact could be taken as indirect evidence of, a, of there being some kind of interpolation somewhere that we're not really, this is not something we're supposed to think about. Okay, so that's, that'd be one way to look at it. So um, just in the interest of time, because I want to, there's a lot of, detail here and I, I want to mostly talk with you um, toward hopefully I can get done by, by 10 of so we can we can talk. Um, I just for in terms of auto, in terms of imagination I just for those of you who this is on this Tumblr site so you can check it out. But I won't play this, I'll just play a little bit of it. Um, I think if you want to kind of envision what interpolation what it would be to play with interpolation and kind of bring it to consciousness. I wanted to show you this piece of imaginary work. This is Steve Reich, an early piece. I have to, like, open and bruise up and let some of the bruised blood come out to show them. Come out to show them, 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 come out 
out to show them to come 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 out okay so that's from Risha's early phasing work um let me just see if I can get this back and it's the the text is from um a, is from a a, a African-American gentleman who made himself bleed in order to be taken in by police in the 68 riots in Harlem. And um, there's a lot to say about what's going on with it. But in terms of this, in terms of um, interpolation, right, it uses imagery in the dance moves that are common to, to dystopian, well, it, actually at the time, it's, they were ironically utopian visions like Metropolis, right, the movie of kind of automated humans that kind of pay on to the automated age. And it kind of suggests that there's very limited kind of room for variation within that structure because the patterns are basically given by the repetition. And all you've got is some space to phase in different time scales. And so what happens is the music is the music, the repetition is two different loops at slightly different speeds and they start to phase out and they create, as they do that, they create a space of dissonance that you can start to look at but there's very little kind of room to move around. So in terms of like imagination, the imagination of presentist modality, this is kind of thinking about a world where we don't have, there, we don't have many options to think beyond the present, right? So think about people, just really simple, people who are like clerks level, you know the movie Clerks, like people who are punching the clock all the time, or people, students, right? Who are trying to like deal with like not having too much loan debt, trying to work your jobs, trying to get your majors, and think about a really kind of bleak economy, right? And so and in the process, there's not a lot of moves that can happen, but there's the sense that you have to kind of keep going according to the rhythm of it. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of uh, way I might imagine present, presentist modality happening through interpolation. Um, okay, so um, last, Last thing that might help on this. So the most for common form of presentism, I would argue, which I'll call de facto presentism, pra presentism that happens is a kind of result of the way people are using their contingent freedom to, to engage in customs and practices in daily life, but not legally required to do things. It's found in our losing sight of future generations as a result of the daily grind and current customs that focus on the present. Um, you can see de facto presentism here in the US when you think again about what you don't find. And what you don't tend to find in mainstream US culture is something I gave an example of this group. A group of people sitting around after work, not for school, thinking about what kind of obligations they owe the future. Now you get that in polit some political groups, you'll get that in some cultures, you might get that in people who stop to, um, could, be a, a, could be a religious practice of being mindful, sitting with the future, praying. Those all would be examples of something that's breaking with the interpolation of presence modality. But, but the fact that there aren't, that there isn't a kind of widespread shared practice and expectation of us sitting around and thinking about what the future deserves, ritualizing it, customizing it, suggests that there's de facto presentism. That's how, what I would argue. And then de jure presentism can be seen, um, de jure, the de jure bias is extremely important, I would argue, because it carries power. Um, it's found in laws and institutional norms that actively omit or impede deep consideration, obligation, and I think, I agree with uh, Rupert Reed, I'm gonna show him in a minute, love toward future generations. Um, you can see that there's de jure presentism in that we don't have things such as, and I'm gonna give an example, we don't have, for instance, like the Onondaga Nation that uh, is from my neck of the woods, the 
Odinsoni people in the Onondaga Nation who have the who have the seventh generation matriarch. We don't have a political system that acts to keep in mind future generations. So I'll just give you Rupert Reed from the Green Party in the UK talking about that for a minute, what it would look like to have that. Why do you think that intergenerational fairness is an issue? Well, intergenerational fairness is an issue because if we aren't fair to the future, there won't be any future. The people of the future are completely dependent upon us. They hang by a, by a thread which we control. And so it is just so, so vital that we are fair to them. And more than that, I would say that we care for them or indeed that we love them. Uh, we ought to extend the same attitude towards future people, it seems to me, that we extend without thinking to our children. And what do you think of the work that the Intergenerational Foundation is doing? Well, I'm very excited to see the Intergenerational Foundation launching. Uh, I wish them every good luck. I've been in contact with Angus Hampton for some time, uh, the coordinator, I think he is, of the Foundation. I think it's a great initiative. Do you see the notion of intergenerational fairness percolating into politics yet? To some extent, but I think we've got a long way to go. Uh, when I'm not on my day job, I am active in the Green Party, and certainly the Green Party is cotton onto this, but I think that there's a very long way to go before other parties and the economic system and so on and so forth really <coughs> absorb this. For example, the fact that we have any kind of discount rate at all uh, applied to um, things like pensions and uh, economic matters accounting within the government suggests that we're not taking future people seriously enough. So what are the main issues that you think that affect intergenerational fairness? Well, there are innumerable issues. The most central one of all is that we've got to take proper care of our ecosystems. If we don't take proper care of our ecosystems, then there is no chance at all that future people are going to have a, a decent existence. So it's about um, protecting our environment properly and uh, taking care of future people by taking care of their home, which is the Earth. But the politics is notoriously short-termism, isn't it? How do you get that long-term vision to think about future generations in this way? Well, it's very difficult. I do have a proposal of my own, which I'm putting forward in a report that I'm writing at the moment, which the Intergenerational Foundation is going to help to promote the discussion of, which is very exciting. My report proposes a mechanism for what you're talking about. The mechanism is guardians for future generations. The idea here is that there would be a sort of super jury which would sit above the House of Lords, above the Upper House, which would have the interests of future people at heart. It would be picked at random from the members of the public, as a, a jury is at present. Um, but the members of this super jury, rather than representing the interests of their peers, would represent the interests of future people. And they would have the power to alter or, in extremis, to veto legislation that worked against the interests of future people. So I'm quite excited, obviously, about this guided proposal. I think it could really shake things up. It would be a way of doing, if you like, a sort of end run around the short-termism of current politics. Have you had any reaction to that yet? Good. So I actually, I, one of the things just to point out is I normally don't like showing clips, but part of the point of this talk is the imagination and also to kind of just bring other voices into it. I'm going to end by showing you some <coughs> stuff that's going on in Cleveland. So just, I beg your uh, patience in that. It's not something I normally do, but I think it's sometimes good, again, with imagination to kind of let things like sink in. Um, so just, just so we're clear about that. Um, and I liked, I liked the run up to that you know, brief proposal. You can read more about it online. There's an entire two hour um, clip that, in which the Green Party created this like digestion, this conceptual political digestion of the proposal. It's called the Guardians of the Future event. And it, it's actually pretty interesting to watch. And just the, the thing that I'm emphasizing right now is that I see president, mo, presentist modality through omission, primarily. I use that as my kind of, my de, kind of as a detective would. And I mean, there are, there's an intergenerational foundation. There's the stuff we're doing in our programs like here or at my school. There are proposals that are um, very interesting. Uh, Stephen Gardner, we were talking about, has a proposal for a global constitutional convention to protect future generations. So it's not like this stuff is not present, but the fact of the matter is, is that, as I think Rupert said very well, our political system and our economic system, along with our dominant economic thinking, just doesn't make room for uh, fairness to future generations. So that, that's, that's a very kind of hard power way of thinking about presentist modality. We don't exist in political systems 
that make it obligatory for us and, and actually a legal requirement for us to, um, to shift our bias toward our own present generation and the way we use resources, the way we expand on the planet, and so on. Okay, good? Okay, yeah. good. All right, so that's the, that's the situation that I see. Um, I often see myself in that. I often see the mainstream of our society in that, and I see a lot of the people that I work with in everyday life in Cleveland in that situation. Um, in the, the other concept I'm going to use from the continental tradition is a really um, almost a sentimentally outmoded concept for a lot of people, but I think it's actually a pretty interesting one. So you remember that Althusser talked about interpolation through the idea of having your name called out. And here's one of the places where I think Althusser is, is in many cases just weirdly not attuned to humanity, um, to the humanity of people. Because actually to be called, um, to be called as something very different than to be kind of made to react automatically. Um, and now obviously the notion of a call is a religious notion, right? Abraham was called and various other sorts of folks were called. Um, but in the phenomenological tradition, there's this attempt to understand what it's like to hard to, to, to say this well in the abstract, what it's like to realize that there is meaning in your life that's so important that when you don't turn around to like address it, it's like you're leaving your humanity behind. And so you have to turn around and address it. That's why I played that music in the beginning. Because for some reason when I hear that music, it's, it's a lullaby. That's actually the modality of a call. It's not this kind of command or this automaticness. It's the thing that outside of all the work obligations, outside of all the shit that we have to do at times, and outside of just the everyday stuff, which is OK. Like, it's not so bad. But we do it. Where it's, it's, it's the experience of a part of, of, of meaning that's out, not exactly in our minds presently, not exactly in our lives presently, that we worry, that we start to, cat, we start to cotton on to it, as Ru Rupert said. And if we don't turn around to address it, we're at risk of losing something very important in our lives to our own humanity. So there's an experience. This doesn't happen all the time, obviously. It sounds fairly exceptional for this experience of being called to happen. But it's actually a very important um, phenomenon, especially if we're submerged in a situation of subjection. Because if this, let's just assume, um, I, I know I'm assuming all sorts of normative stuff here, but if you give me the thought that there is such a thing as bias <laughs> against future generations, <coughs> so it's un, unjustified, and if you give me the thought that we do exist in a presentist modality, then it would seem important that we acknowledge those parts of our lives that turn us around. I'm definitely using the religious idea of conversion, conversio, to be turned with. So that we're turned with a reminder or a memory or an experience of the things that actually are being left out of the picture, but which are actually the moral, human, loving things that should be thought about. So. Um, I won't go into too much more about this. You can look at it. I have a funny <laughs> picture of this weird French Catholic, Jean-Luc Marion, who's done a lot to talk about it. But I will just say one thing about the Foucauldian, Foucaultian schools. So they make a distinction between subjection and subjectivation, which is awful French jargon. But subjectivation is the opposite of subjection. So in subjection, we're like those figures in Come Out. We, we have to just do the thing we've been trained to do unreflectively. And there's a, dehumaniz there's a dehumanizing involved in subjection. Um, there are less objectionable forms of subjection. Foucault is very, um, very interesting on this spectrum. But for the purposes of what we're talking about, think of the, the, the harsher imagery of subjection. Subjectivation happens when we start to become aware, for instance, of president, the presentist modality. We become aware of the automatic norms we've accepted. And we start to develop something like in the, the tradition would simply call self-consciousness. But that self-consciousness then is put in the service of 
realizing our agency in creating a world that is truly meaningful to us. So subjection in many terms is the realm of agency, as it's used in some um, left, leftist politics. It's the realm of um, active democracy, for people who are interested in democratic theory. And it's also, interestingly, the realm of all kinds of practices that people do in daily life in order to stay human, from the non-performance-driven kind of body practices, right? So there is this subjection that's happening in, say, yoga communities, where you have to like perform in your yoga in order to have status, and blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, there, there are many. There, there are, uh, anyways, where I'm from, there's this, and if you go to Brooklyn, there's like the hipsterism of yoga. Right? I've been to Philly, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's okay. okay. So so right, but there's also there also <laughs> there's also what yoga is supposed to be about. Right. right? Or what meditation <laughs> can be about. Or what um, what what various kinds of mindfulness practices can be about. Those also are subjectivizing practices. You use them in order to develop consciousness of your situation, mindfulness, and to think about the kind of life you'd like to create for yourself. So whereas interpolation um, subjects us by, by, I would just say, eliciting an automatic reaction. Um, this thing that in the tradition is called the call subjectivizes us by soliciting a space in which we think about the kind of world that would really live up to our humanity, is the language that I use. Other people use different language. And so before we head straight to anthroponomy in a minute, which is the thing you officially came here for, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to talk about, for, if I was going to talk about the imagination around anthroponomy, to go back to, what, to, to something that Alan had, had said that some of you are working on, I would start with the, the, what, what we think of as the first personal, uh, the experience of, uh, of myself as a person. I, this is what my life, this is how I live, how my imagination is, how my world is imaginatively structured through these two concepts of interpolation on the one hand and the cry or the call on the other. And I would put them in light of the question of presentist modality. So just, just one last thing, because it sounds like you're you know, interested in some of these mindful pra mindfulness practices. Many people often ask me, well, if I'm in a mindfulness practice, I learn how to be present. Is that a form of presentism? And the answer is no, ironically not. Just like the sexist doesn't understand sex, actually pun intended, but we could get into that, the presentist doesn't actually understand presence. So we could get into this if we're interested, but mindfulness practices actually open up an awareness of time as something that in some sense is a chance and can fall on people, as Rawls said, wherever they, that people fall into time without any necessity. And so my time could be someone else's time. Another person's time could be my time. And presence in the mindfulness tradition actually allows you to see that. So presence actually is a everyday form. It can be used as an everyday form to become responsible in the face of um, presentist modality, if that makes sense. OK. Um, one last thing. The form of the call, right, and the, uh, this is very important for the next, the, the, now the argument's going to move a little bit more quickly, is um, what Stephen Darwall, um, I really like his, this, I really like this work, he's a um, philosophy, a moral philosophy professor at Yale, he, what he calls this, it's second personal, it's addressed to you, but not you like you have an automatic response, it's like you, Alan, let's, come on, let's, I, I need to talk to you about something. Let's, right, so Darwell talks about systems of, or kind of situations of mutual recognition, and he thinks that they're basic to morality. In morality, we expect the people that we live with to treat us with basic respect and to acknowledge something, he thinks of it as our rights. And the, the so there's a, he talks about the interpersonal structure to moral life. Um, and there's a link to this in the phenomenological tradition. It goes all the way back to the um, Hasidic thinker um, Buber, but and, and in some ways also to Hegel. But but the idea is is that when you're addressed in a call, it's you. Somebody's calling out to you, and there's a there's something on the order of a moral imperative there. That if you don't listen to this call, 
you're going to be failing your humanity, as I put it, or failing an obligation, or failing something central to your life. And it's as if you're being addressed in the second person. Okay, so why is that important? Um, I'm going to skip over this. I'm going to skip over this just in the interest of time. Let me see what I put here. Okay, that's just a paper. Okay. Um, I'll just put a footnote that as we're in the realm of the second person, we're in the realm of morality. And in my more, it more, now we're moving a little closer to some technical work, I think of this as different than ethics. The important point I'm that I want to make is that if we have a moral call to address a situation, it's not something that's just desirable or undesirable that's being addressed to us. It's a demand. It's in the form of a claim. So to fail to, uh, to, fail to heed a moral call is to um, actually not be a decent human being. Decent people acknowledge moral claims. Okay? So the reason I think this is important, and this, this is really a hard area for environmental imagination, is that I think, but it's amazing how different people's intuitions are on this point. I think it's quite clear that even though future generations are, aren't in existence, that they call us morally which sounds paradoxical. Um, this, to me, is a real problem of environmental imagination. Because many, th there's a kind of dividing line in people. People either see this or they don't see this. And it's not, I don't mean this in absolute terms. There's just various kind of gradations of, no, this sounds far-fetched, or no, this is completely obvious. But insofar as we have a notion of bias, we have to have a notion that's like a claim. And if we have a notion that's like a claim, we need the possibility of second person address. I accept Darwin on this point. We need the if we need the possibility of second personal address, we need the possibility that the future is literally addressing us. But of course, the future doesn't literally address us. So it, this seems like a complete paradox. So how do you get bias how do, you get, how do you get outside of a presentist modality, which requires uprooting bias toward future generations, if you're not capable of getting a second personal address or a moral claim coming from the future? I think this is a complete mess for the imagination, but it seems like it's required by the logic of what's going on. Anyways, in my case, I think that there is clearly a call from future people to um, be fair to them. And so, um, to me, since it's a moral call, since it's fairness, since it's a claim, this is the most obvious reason to me why I must pursue anthroponomy. And so now I'm gonna present, in the last like 10 minutes, I'm gonna give you the idea of anthroponomy, okay? And here's, there's a brief argument here. Um, it's even a stronger, argument. It's about freedom. I'll just list it really quickly, but I'm not going to have time to go through it. Um, since I assume that we do have an obligation to future generations, in other words, are subject to a second person address or call from them, and therefore must be morally responsible to them, and since being responsible is a condition of being autonomous, um, in other words, if I'm not exercising, if I'm not being responsible, I can't be said to be living in line with my norms. Um, Failing to heed the call of future generations is a failure of autonomy. And so therefore, by failing to structure my life in such a way that I can be subjectivized by the call of future generations, I fail to be free. It's a pretty strong argument. Meaning, I don't know if it's strong in terms of a good argument, it's strong in terms of the kinds of conclusions it's demanding. Okay, um, I'm just mindful of time here. So what I do in this section, I'll just let you read it if, later if you want to, um, is I try to argue that whereas future generations, I think, give us a very clear obligation to engage in anthroponomy, which I'll get to at the tail end of the talk, I also think that um, I'll just group it under the risk of six math the sixth mass extinction, I'll, I'll group it under that. I also think that the effect that we're having on the rest of the world of 
the, the non-human world of life, um, uh, can be seen as having a, an analogous form as the call that comes from future generations. And I, I create a, try to begin to create a concept here that I'm drawing from uh, a philosopher I like great, a great deal named Cora Diamond, and then the, the writer Jam Kutzi. Um, if, if many of you may have read The Lives of Animals, which is an amazing book. It's about a fictional character named Elizabeth Costello who has stopped caring so much about her <coughs> writing. She's a famous novelist, and she's become an advocate for um, you know, an advocate against the factory farming of animals. And um, they use the concept of a, the, the expression from, the, from Kutzi's book is that Costello felt that she was living, she was herself embodying a cry like a wounded animal. It's an amazing line. And the idea that someone could embody a cry is something that really interests me. I think that when you look at our effect on the rest of the world of life, the non-human world of life, um, to the extent to which we're risking a mass extinction, um, and just in parentheses, I've worked a bit on this kind of this topic of mass extinction, and I, I think that it, it, talk about it is very confusing. I think the most disturbing thing I've found about mass extinction is I'm not convinced that we can know that we're in one until it's too late. I, I don't agree with many of the people who say that we are in one, and I think there are uh, epistemic reasons why we can't know, and that's probably the most disturbing thing about that field. But anyways, I think that we can use that area of the great impact we have on the rest of the world of life to talk through those beings in the world of life who deserve justice, and that those are, those are beings that have the ability to to be, as Reagan would say, subjects of life, or to have a life that matters to them. So usually, um, uh, what we think of as, I don't like this term, but higher functioning animals. Um, I think that they, through their position, their position in ecosystems, can be said to, to act as proxy spokespersons, or uh, I, I, reference points for the rest of those beings in the world that are being drawn down and destroyed by us, but who can't deliver claims on us. And I think it's intelligible to construct an imaginary concept of those beings who can exert claims on us as, being, as, as speaking to us in the realm of a cry. So whereas I talk about future, future generations addressing us through a call, I like to think about the rest of the world of life exit, uh, addressing us through a cry which is a kind of second personal claim through those, um, those uh, more apex ecosystemic beings that, uh, that, that can be subjects of justice. <coughs> All right, so that's, um, that's that. And I, I just have some like, asides on Martha Nussbaum's stuff about justice against species, but I won't, or with, towards species, but I won't go into that now. Okay. So let's just end with talking about anthroponomy. So I, I think that there are two different moral reasons why I have to take responsibility for the presentist modality of our current civilization. I have to engage in that with other people. The one is the moral reason of a call from future generations. The second is the moral reason of a cry from um, the wider universe, the, the wider non-human uh, universe of life. The question, the next big question I've been trying to ask myself is that insofar as that this is a characteristic of what's called the Anthropocene, it's extremely overwhelming to everyday people to think about the call and the cry. It's too much. And it overwhelms every kind of person that I talk to who's not an academic ready to kind of attack it with all the arsenal of analytic distinctions. And uh, there's a, a guy, I really, his work is really, really hard for me to kind of understand and deal with, but there's a very popular English professor now named Timothy Morton who says that the Anthropocene is a hyper-object. Um, it creates this term called a hyper-object. It basically means something that we know is there and happening, but we can't objectify it. Um, I won't go into my debate with him. I think that it's problematic. But the upshot of his understanding of the Anthropocene as a hyperobject is that we should be kind of perpetually overwhelmed by the experience of living in the Anthropocene. 
what I like what I like to do in that situation is do two things. I like to argue that um, in fact human imagination um, is immensely powerful when it sets itself a task and in any case can't be decided against until we've tried systematically and pervasively as a society to engage imaginatively with an object. Um, and I also like to point out that um, you know, once science is able to act as an um, extended and institutionally segmented mind, the combination of, let's just call it art and science, to try to grasp something that seems ungraspable is quite powerful, and it ought to be, um, ought to be really tested out and iterated over generations before we can agree with Morton that there's some kind of epistemologically overwhelming object here. Rather, I suspect that his concern is with the moral call and the moral cry, and the extent to which it's completely overwhelming to think about how any of us as individuals, or even in small groups, can it deal with the, the collective action problem of a planetary civilization that's plunging us into the Anthropocene and putting future generations at risk. So, in answer to this hyperobject called the Anthropocene, I like to propose that we should think of the concept of anthroponymy. So what is the concept of anthroponymy? The concept of anthroponymy is it's very simple, but unfortunately that means it's also very, very big, abstract, and vague present. But at least is a clear goal. I believe that people need hope in order to do things, and that we, we, need, and we need clear goals in order to function as a collective engaged in structural change. I think that that's important for people. Um, Kant has an argue for the, argument for this that goes back to the concept of rational faith, but that's another more technical discussion. So anthroponymy to me is, seems to me the logical object that we ought to shoot for. And so I'm starting to try to shift discussion. Um, in, like, in Cleveland, we, 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 we're, you know, we, I'll point out lower, we're actually talking about this as a group. Um, these, none of these people are academics. This is just, this is a group of, this is a civil society group talking about this. Um, I say we should talk about the age of anthroponymy and aim for anthroponymy. So anthroponymy is the collective self-regulation of humankind as a whole. <laughs> right, so as autonomy is the self regulating itself in line with what really matters to it, living a life that matters to it in a way that allow those things that matter to it to be expressed in that life and not undermined. So anthroponymy is the collective regulation of humankind in such a way that the pervasive deep obligations that we have as humans aren't undermined by the unintentional effects of our collective civilization. Does that make sense? Is it a big idea or no? Okay, good. So that's anthroponymy. Um, I call it, instead of a hyper-object, I call it an idealistic object. And I guess I'm in, favor, um, I'm in favor of introducing idealism as a category that's needed for moral action, for responding to the call and the cry. Um, I actually think that cynicism, insofar as it's become a pervasive part of a lot of the youth culture I engage with at times, uh, this is maybe not Generation Z, but definitely millennial culture. Um, I think that's a symptom of the presentist modality as it rubs off on people. Um, so we could talk about that. Kant, I think Kant is right that we need ideal objects in order to function as reasonable beings and to feel that there's hope in the world. Um, okay, so I'm, I don't have time to go through the argument because I figure it'll come up in, in um, discussion, but my argument for the need for anthroponymy is very simple. I look at, I basically look at the, main, the, the core obligations of, of the major religions, not because I think that minoritarian religions are not important, but just because I'm trying to go for a big picture look at, at values that humans hold or obligations that humans acknowledge. And then I also look at the human rights tradition. And in the first book that Alan mentioned, basically the premise of the book was to show that if you take just the sense of common humanity implicit in the human rights tradition, we're way greener than we think. And that many of the kind of antitheses that used to get set up between deep ecology and the human rights tradition or the humanitarian tradition fold under a careful acknowledgement of what really goes into a sense of humanity.
But I think even just looking at the human rights tradition, there's clear obligations to fellow humans. And there, is, um, there are clear documents that acknowledge the rights of future generations. Um, the major religions also acknowledge future generations. And surprisingly, there's actually very well, I mean, it, this shouldn't be surprising to us, but it would be surprising if you looked at the quality of, say, the, the discussion around the presidential debate or the presidential election. I mean, the idea that life is not just something you waste, but that it requires a good enough reason to use it, and that it's not acceptable to be wanton with the world of life is common to all the major religions. So I use these very central obligations or values in some cases to argue that if on the whole our civilization is undermining common humanity, um, imperiling future generations, or at least heavily biased, being heavily biased against them, and wantonly um, destroying uh, much of the world of life. Again, that's the marker for the sixth mass extinction, or the worry of the sixth mass extinction. Then we're clearly um, not anthroponymous. In other words, the unintended collective effects of our action are undermining the core obligations that we ought to we hold, and certainly I would also argue we ought to hold. So that's why I, that's the that's the core idea for why anthroponymy seems the goal that needs to be upheld. Um, and let me just let me just end with this. So, in terms of like the moral argument, I have a paper that Alan and I, Alan's been helping me think about how I want to argue this paper. But the core moral argument has to do with how anthroponymy would affect our concept of being a decent person, of a moral person. Since anthroponymy is so vast as an idea, right? There's always the question of what it would be for each of us, insofar as we heed the call and the cry, to engage in, in a life that is mindful of the need for the entire, in all of humankind to self-regulate itself anthroponomically. And um, I, the, the upshot of this argument is basically an, a, a, a species of a kind of argument for political responsibility. <laughs> um, it seems to me that we have to begin to see political responsibility for our institutions as a feature of human decency. That's not a, that's not a very, that's a fairly matter of fact claim in many traditions. Um, but the reason why it makes sense in anthroponomy is that as you saw with Rupert's, uh, with Rupert's five minute clip, um, it's the political institutions that shape the collective patterns. Or as, as you saw with the de, de facto presentism, it's the presence or lack of customs and social practices that affect the patterns of everyday people and what kind of organization is possible. So it seems to me that, it, that, that I mean, there's a whole debate, and obviously very common to, to life here in Oregon, about personal lifestyle environmentalism. And one of, in the, this section of kind of my argument in the larger version of this, wants to argue that we ought to switch away from kind of concerns around personal lifestyle environmentalism to understanding political responsibility and civic engagement as the kind of core and basic fe feature of a decent person um, who's just trying to be mindful. And that responsibility has to be responsibility to change the kinds of institutions that pattern us, let's say, in a presentist modality. Um, so the upshot is this, that um, if, if any of us who are aware and able are not working in some capacity to change or to support change of the institutions that are currently limiting us from anthroponomy, then we're being less than fully solid people. That seems to follow from the rough argument. Or, to put it the other way, solidly responsible people would support and promote anthroponomy. Um, I, give a couple, I give a spatial and a temporal axis that that could be worked on. And then I actually end by talking about what it's like to create mindfulness in everyday life. But I think um, the time is up, so I will stop now and see what you want to digest further. <laughs>